Discover your inner goddess and live up to your highest value and most abundant potential. Welcome to Grateful Goddesses, a podcast that empowers you to unleash your inner goddess and take the leap of faith to live your best life. Your guide, Karen Pulver, joins her fellow goddesses in soulful conversations about gratitude, personal growth, authentic living, and a bevy of topics affecting women today. Let's start the show with your host, Karen Pulver. Sharon Nice Arbus grew up in Montreal and received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Concordia University's Communication Studies program. After working as a copywriter in advertising for several years, the writing bug bit Sharon on her right hand and led her to the local coffee shop to write the stories of teen drama with a little bit of humor. My So-Called Friends and Me is a story that is entirely fiction, written with the hopes to teach young readers that no matter how bad it gets, you too will come out on the other side, stronger and smarter, with the help of the unexpected to get you through it all. After writing, the, after her second book, The Get Up Book, is Meaningful Stories, Practical Exercises, and Expert Advice, which is written by Sharon with David Newton. It's amazing what could affect you each day, a post that you saw, the way a person stands, a test that you failed. It may be hard to realize now, but the mistakes that are made in your life can bring incredible lessons that shape who you are today. The choices that you make and the situations that unfold all occur for a reason, as difficult as they may be. The end result is for you to learn from them. The best part, you will be able to share the rainbow after the rain. After Sharon wrote me and my so-called friends, it, which was published in 2015, she visited several middle school classrooms in Toronto and received tremendous feedback about the humorous and relatable storyline. Bringing the novel into the classroom was a natural fit, and so a teacher's manual called Brave the Waves was born. Brave the Waves is a program for building resiliency and is the result of collaboration between Sharon Nice Arbus, social workers, educators, and psychologists, and was formally written by Ms. Deborah Rogers, B.Ed. M.A. It is targeted towards middle school youth in grade six to eight. Thank you so much, Sharon, for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. Whether you're listening on the podcast, watching on YouTube, or reading the blog, we are so grateful that you are here. So I have a story. When I was 14, all my friends in junior high had this parachute jumpsuit. It was white or black, and it had the zipper up the front, and it was very lightweight material. I think it was on MTV on some of the videos. Anyway, they all had it and I wanted one. My mother refused to get it just because it was very expensive and she just didn't think that it was necessary. So I was the one kid out of my friends who didn't have one. Well, one day I went downtown to Yorkville uh, in Toronto and I spotted in a store a parachute jumpsuit half price. The only glitch is that it wasn't white or black, it was peach. But that was okay. The girl in the store said it looked great, and I bought it. I wore it to school the Monday morning, and I was feeling fantastic. My parachute jumpsuit, I straightened my hair because my hair was all crazy, and I showed up to school. And at my locker, I opened my locker, I took out my like, you know, gigantic stack of books and my pencil case, and I turned as my friends started to walk up to me. And they were saying, wow, look at your parachute jumpsuit, and now you have one just like us. Well, one of my so-called friends came up to me, let's just say her name was Diane, and Diane said, love your jumpsuit. She grabbed my pencil case, unzipped it, threw it down the hall, tapped my books out of my hand, and not only that, but took the zipper to my jumpsuit, I'm not gonna do it now, but you can imagine, unzipped it all the way down to the, basically my crotch. So it opened up, I, I didn't even know what hit me. I was feeling embarrassed, my friends were watching, she was one of my friends, they were laughing at me, no one was helping me, and it wasn't until a teacher came out into the hall, it felt like hours, it was only a few seconds, but the teacher came out and saw me and helped me gather my books, I zipped, you know, she even said to me, You're, it's undone, I didn't even realize, zipped up my jumpsuit. Anyway, let's go to lunch in the cafeteria. Here I am at lunch, sitting with my so-called friends, 
And I look over at Diane and I'm like, speechless. In my mind, I'm saying to her, how could you have done that to me? Why did you do that to me? What did I do to you? Nothing came out of my mouth, just smile and laughter along with my friends. But that moment stuck with me forever. And a few years ago, I went back to Toronto to my junior high reunion. And here I am at my locker again, thinking about this moment. I found, located that locker. I'm thinking about this moment. And honest to God, I see a few of my old high school friends, including Diane. She came up to me and I said, I had the courage. And I said, do you remember that moment? I sort of was joking and I was like, remember my jumpsuit and the zipper and the whole thing? And she said, no, I don't, I don't remember. All I remember about you is that I was really jealous of you. I was having a really hard time in my family. My parents were fighting and my brother was out doing crazy things. And I remember seeing you and you had an older boyfriend and you looked like you had it all. And I saw you every day and I was just feeling really jealous and I'm sorry. And it hit me like, wow. And what I'm excited about today is our guest. Our guest today, Sharon Nice Arbus, the author of Me and My So-Called Friends, one of her books, has this beautiful story about a girl going through struggles in junior high and how resiliency and support helps her get through and see what's on the other side of the rainbow. Had I known then, this was me, with my hair, <laughs> had I known then how to have reacted well to that friend and how to have treated myself, I perhaps could have, I don't know, just dealt with life a little differently. And you can notice I'm wearing this necklace from my boyfriend. So interesting, that's how it was. And that's how I dealt with that situation. So we're going to dive in deep about situations that girls get into in school, et cetera, and how they can help deal with how others can help them deal with that to get through. I'm really okay. excited to be here. Thank you for having me today. I'm so glad you're here. I would love to know, Michelle, joining us, did you have a moment like that? I had many moments like that. <laughs> I moved around. And um, so not only did I have experiences similar to you, but I was the new girl. Right. You know? And so that was, that was really difficult for sure. And Sharon, did you as well? Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, uh, Me and My Soka Friends was my first book. And, you know, a lot of people who read the book, my, my friends especially said, I can so hear your voice when I read the book. Now, I have to be honest and say that the book um, is not autobiographical. Uh, it's, not, it's not a biography. It is not what happened to me. Although it is an amalgamation of what I went through, what I saw, and my imagination. So, I mean, there's a couple of instances that um, are similar, but I had to push it further to make it more entertaining for the reader. So yes, I've definitely been through a lot of drama, just like any other teenage girl. Well, this, um, this, um, this, this passage here, when I was reading it, this is how I felt that moment. I felt like I was deep sea fishing among the sharks and being eaten alive on the embarrassment scale of one to 10. This was about 66. Yeah. It's so true. What was that from? I I forget what passage that was from. Oh, this was where she was. um, Hold on a second. I think it was after the party. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a very embarrassing situation and you know a little bit of romance too I mean it's always exciting to have a love interest in a book I also want to demonstrate what a healthy relationship looks like Mm -hmm. and I think the relationship between Lizzie and um oh my goodness thank you (laughs) Jimmy it's been a while since I've reread the book and I wrote it many years ago forgive me uh with Jimmy it's a healthy relationship so in the book Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to outline for the people listening, if they haven't read the book, the basic premise is a girl named Lizzie coming back from camp and seeing her friends in school, and then a rumor being spread around about her with a boy and more that embarrasses her and how she reacts to her friends 
reaction to her and how they've treated her. And, how- and also have also that the relationship has changed as they got older and how she feels with her friends. And maybe these aren't the friends that she needs to support her as she's getting older. And the support that she reaches out to when she goes through, I should say, you know, a psychological breakdown, because there is a, a part in the book where um, she's admitted to the hospital and um, things she's are... a panic attack, like, yeah. Yeah, she had a panic attack that requires her to reach out for the proper support. Exactly. And as being a grateful goddess in our 40s and 50s and up, we talk a lot on these episodes about making mistakes and how we can get back up. And uh, a mistake is like a happy accident, as Bob, Bob Ross says, and the painter, and how important it is to have resilience. And I know when I studied in education, I took a class called Adolescence and the Young, um, and we talked about the frontal cortex of a child's brain is not fully developed. I don't mean to get scientific here, but until you're 25. So I'm wondering if that has anything to do with how girls and boys can react to each other, like they just don't fully understand, they're sort of more egocentric. Did you think about that at all when writing the book? I didn't think about that, although I do that that is a pretty known fact that the brain is developed until age 25. However, uh, in my world, I I think I demonstrate pretty well to my children who are now 19, 17, and 21 um, that it's okay to fail. And I demonstrate that by example. And I look at the word fail as in first attempt in learning. And before I published this book, uh, first of all, it wasn't an easy task to publish a book. I went through many, many rejections. I still have the rejection letters. And I actually posted on Instagram, I think about two years ago. And it's not a straight line. And my kids witnessed that. They saw my rejection letter from Scholastic and Penguin Books. I don't know what other publishers I reached out to, but they saw it all. And then when they, I finally got the cover and then I finally got a book in my hand, they like, wow, like that was a huge risk you took. And I took another risk by putting out, I guess, art, my writing, whether it's a painting, writing project. I put it out to the world, not knowing what the result would be. And that's a huge risk. And I'm so glad I did that because I see so far in their short lives, they've taken risks and they've decided to, I'm just going to do that. It's going to try. And they're not 25 years old yet. Mm -hmm. So, and they're learning that I'm going to just do it anyhow, even though I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And I was so scared. Oh my gosh. To put something that I worked on for years and it's creative and there's no right or wrong answer, but it's my work. And now the whole world is going to read it. That's super scary. In it's, my world. it's being very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And, but you were determined and you persisted and yeah, you took a risk and what could have been the worst thing? No one liked it. Okay. Actually my goal was to have it like publish it and then put it in my neighborhood bookstore and that's it. <laughs> but so where it is now. Yeah, so now it it kind of snowballed. Yeah. And so may I go on to how it snowballed? Of course. Okay. So I wrote the book, and it's all very nice and good, and people read it, and, you know, it slowly caught on to a lot of grade seven girls, and the parents came up to me and said, you know, my daughter doesn't read, but she loves your book. I'm like, oh, okay. So then um, the organization, um, formerly known as uh, Jewish Women's Renaissance Project, JWRP, I think it's called Momentum now, they take women to Israel to help empower them and educate them about uh, Jewish identity and history. They had a mentorship, like um, a fellowship program, and one of the women um, who work for the organization said, you have something in this book that should be in the classrooms. And we're running this program where we can help you get there. I took the program. I went to Washington for a couple of days, came back to Toronto. I created an advisory board based on social workers, psychologists, and teachers. 
And together, um, we created Brave the Waves, which is a teacher's manual that is curriculum based on the book, Me and My So-Called Friends. And there are 10 lessons that pull out certain excerpts that deal with a topic of subjects such as stress and anxiety, communication, relationships, dealing with goals. And it goes through the book and helps you really understand that, yeah, life is hard. Life is amazing. It's fun. You cry. You get through it. You find support. And so it's really needed, especially now. Absolutely. And I did notice that you do have um, a sample exercise with uh, elastic around your wrist that when you get feel anxious, you can snap it to kind of remind yourself like it's going to be okay or just sort of like to keep you grounded and keep you, you know. Yeah, there's a sample lesson on my website. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's wonderful to help individuals. Michelle, what would you like to ask? I was thinking that um, I've long believed, I mean, my kids are grown now, they're 22 and 25, but um, I remember when they were younger and in school, I've long ago believed, um, or since a long time ago, I believed that um, we should teach these things to our kids um, in the school setting. And I think that this is fantastic, Sharon. I, I just oh, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> excuse me. I think, you know, that and life skills and, and, you know, certain other things are just not taught. And it's such a shame. It's such a disservice to our kids. So I love that you're doing this. I think it's amazing. Thank and you. so my question is, so um, is it, you know, a Toronto wide program? Where are you doing this? Well, right now it's in six schools in Toronto. Um, and they, well, before COVID, they were doing it mostly during the lunch hour. I have to say that the Jerome D. Diamond Center is a private school, part of GFNCS. They really have used the program thoroughly um, in, in detail. I actually uh, do, well, I was doing in-person readings before COVID. Now I was doing virtual meetings, uh, book readings, question and answers. So I'm you know, trying to get into more schools. However, I um, had to put that on the side burner right now because I'm working on my second book, which is called The Get Up Book, which I'm really excited about that book. Um, I'm writing in collaboration with David Newton, who is a movement therapist and boarding communications. And it's a series of short stories that have meaningful lessons and then David Newton has written exercises to go with it. So the stories will really uh, be penetrated and um, have a different um, perspective, especially following exercises. Wow. And that's exactly what people need are actionable steps. You can learn about a concept, but then you really need encouragement to take a step forward to try it and with support. And that's basically the grateful goddess mission that I have is, you know, learning from the podcasts and YouTubes, but then meeting us on GGTV to meet with the guest, interact, and then try out certain exercises or certain experiences or have discussions, and then hopefully carry that over to your life and add it to your life if you choose to. And um, I'm so curious, though, what motivated you to, to write your first book? I always had a story in my head. So first of all, I used to be a copywriter in advertising. Uh, many years ago and I love love writing it's just something that completely relaxes me it takes me to a different place almost like time travel you know when I was backpacking through Europe and towards the end of my trip my most memorable happy time was when I would sit at a cafe by myself for the entire day and just write and that to me is is pure bliss so when I first had my first child, I would drop him off at nursery school and then I would go to my local coffee shop in the Forest Hill Village, order myself a mochaccino <laughs> and I had a notebook and I would sit and write for two, three hours and it was amazing and I would just escape to Lizzie's world. Mm -hmm. That was so much fun and I'd create all these characters and I do it like um, two, three times a week. I didn't do it every day. I would have less writer's block that way. 
um, it was just fun. And it was pen and paper, not computer. It was pen and paper. Yeah. I have to say now with my second book, I am writing directly on my laptop. Okay. I think I've lost that pen and paper. I, I, I still write ideas in my agenda and like on cocktail nap, not cocktail napkins, but yeah. napkins, whatever thing I have. Like, oh, I have an idea. I'll write something down. Mm-hmm. But uh, now I'm like, you know, laptop. But back then I was definitely um, pen to paper and it was just a blast. And so in what ways, like what are some, I know the example uh, for the the new book with the elastic, but how do you feel me and my so-called friends will help, especially teenage girls? That they're not alone. That, you know, for your story of your parachute peach outfit, oh my goodness. Do you remember those? (laughs) You know, well now you know, but I could have, you know, I'm sure it's like any, your mother could have told you that girl who's driving you crazy has some stuff going on in the background that you don't know about. And that is a hundred percent the case. So by reading the book, it's just a fun way to escape the world we are living in right now, unfortunately, but also to realize that they are not alone, um, that it's okay to get support. It's okay to change friends and to find someone that you actually feel comfortable with. It's okay to strive for something that's hard. Like she was having a hard time in math class and she just didn't sit there. She did whatever she could to pass that course. And so she went to her teacher in the after hours and you know, tried her hardest. And so she could do hard things. So whatever comes your way, what kind of, whatever stumbling block comes your way, there is a way to get around it, to tackle it, to achieve a goal. And I think to know that you have that inside of you, but how are you going to tap into it and bring it out? I mean, I talked to 50, you know, mid 50 year old women about this and still struggling. I'm still struggling. I'm on this journey. Michelle, do you too sometimes feel that way? Well, yeah, Karen and I have talked a lot about, um, you know, you just mentioned, um, finding different friends. And, you know, we're in our mid fifties, a little older than Karen, fine. <laughs> and we're still doing that. I'm still doing that. And it's beautiful though, because I feel like um, I've just really surrounded myself with just, you know, top quality people and, uh, you know, who aren't mean and who are just giving and, and loving, but it's, it's always a process. And so I think it's important for, for, especially for younger, young women, you know, young girls, but um, boys too, to really learn these things. And they don't have to stay in that environment that doesn't, you know, match where they're at. I feel too, the teacher who helped me in my situation in the hall, she just helped me pick up my stuff and said, are you okay? And I said, yes. I feel that if teachers understand, you know, what your book is, is saying and demonstrating, and um, especially if they're using it in their curriculum, that will help them to be more empathic and take further action. Because exactly. I, didn't, I didn't get into it. I acted like everything was fine. I didn't tell my mom or my dad. I didn't tell my sister. And I wish I did just to have that support. I kind of acted like, okay, it's fun. And, and I still was so-called friends with them until we left you know, and went to high school. And then I just wasn't. But it was so interesting seeing her again as an adult and her you know, I had that closure, which was great. Not everyone gets that closure. And trust me, it creeped up. You know, when I'd go to therapy and talk about stuff and feeling insecure, that little moment in the hallway crept up. And we, you know, I would shove it down as an adult, but I needed to release it and then to have closure. How beautiful was that? So I feel like this book is just an amazing, so thoughtful way of helping girls. Um, and teens, just to help them. Now I want to talk to about the parents, about the mothers who are who have these teen girls. Because now mm. I'm a mom. I have two girls and a boy. And trust me, I don't want anything bad or mean or anything bullying to happen to them. And so I was almost that helicopter parent with my girls because I was bullied. And I did not want them to be bullied. So I would ask them and kind of go too much in their face, like, oh, what do you mean she didn't like your outfit? Or, oh, 
okay, I'll go get you the outfit. I was like making sure that they had all of the jeans that all the girls had. Like it was a bit excessive. And my husband had to stop me and say, they don't have to have like every designer, everything just to fit in. They should be okay with not. And I would turn to him and say, well, you don't understand. Like that's so important. So what do you tell mothers or fathers who are that helicopter parent who want to step in and fix things, whether it be with clothing, with, with tests, with essays, with, with trophies, all of those types of scenarios? Um, it's a great question. And I learned this, luckily, early, early on in my parenting career. I read the book, Blessings of a Skinned Knee. Mm-hmm. And forgive me, but I forget. I think her name was Wendy, Wendy Mogul, if that mm-hmm. makes any yeah. sense. Yes. Is that her? I heard her speak here in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And she that book was the amazing. I think I read it when my kids were toddlers. And that was like, okay, let them fall, get a skin knee, maybe give them the band-aid, but let them learn. Yeah. And but it's not easy. It's also really difficult when they're talking to you and you want to give them the answer, here's the free answer, do this. But it's really imperative to let them fail because when they fail, they're the best lessons. So I had to, I guess I really wasn't a helicopter parent, even though my daughter says that I am. <laughs> but I let her fail. Like I'd let her, I let my, my both boys fail. Like just go, just do it, take the risk see what happens. Um, And you have to let go and and zip up the lip and it's not easy. Well, I've been through, I've been through both. I've, I've had the experiences like I mentioned, and then I've had the experiences where I have let them fail, you know, um, failing classes or not handing things in on time or, um, you know, the only thing that I never changed was if they forgot their lunch because I never forgot what Me my too. daughter said. She had to eat the school food, which was disgusting. So I always brought their lunch. Um, but other uh-huh. than that, uh, I won't do it now. You know, they're, they're young adults, <laughs> but you can imagine, right? Here's your lunch, honey, for my 26-year-old son. No, that's not happening. But I will say that there's been times where I have noticed and, and I'm struggling like, oh no, I have to fix this. And Oh, you know, you feel so bad for that kid who is of your, of your kids, who's so unhappy with the situation. And like you said, you want to just say the answer because you've lived through it. Yeah. You can share your stories. I've told my girls about the parachute jumpsuit. They laugh at it. And they're like, you know, my older daughter is like, why didn't you say anything, mom? Like I would have told her to F off. Like, <laughs> and she would have. You're so distraught. You don't know what to do. You're like, uh, like you know, you want to say it. Probably the next day you had a great comeback line, right? <laughs> with, with at school that time. Yeah, like I should have um, done that. No, I didn't. I. That's what I'm telling you. I pushed it down, and I just went with the crowd and the flow. And I kind of, you know, it surfaced out later. Like I realized, you know, that feeling of not being secure. I had insecurity issues because I would feel like even as an adult. I feel like I still some, you know, feel insecure. I'll, I'll be vulnerable and tell the world that. Like, and I wonder if it bubbles down to some of those experiences as a teen. Because, yeah, I had braces. I had frizzy hair. I didn't feel. I thought you look, I think you look great. But, you know, whatever yeah, happened. I didn't feel great. And I was dating this older guy who, <sighs> who you know, I'm wearing his number one necklace. Like, yeah. you would think by looking at this, oh, she's you know, cute, whatever. But I didn't feel good at all. Like I was tall. I was taller than all the boys. I had boobs. None of my friends had boobs. So you just don't know what a teen is going through. If they, in your mind as an adult, look, oh, she's tall. She's pretty. She has boobs, has an older boyfriend. But I was not feeling that way inside. So it's important as parents, as teachers, as friends to just like you said, Sharon, listen, zip it, and then provide support, like this book and your program, which is phenomenal. Now, yeah. Michelle, go ahead. Sorry, Sharon, I, I, I can't help but think about this time of, you know, COVID and, and kids are quarantined and, you know, living from um, inside their homes and having to Zoom or see their friends at a distance. And I know um, I've heard of cases not, you know, far removed from me where it's very sadly kids are committing suicide. Um, 
how do you think you're, have you thought about how your book might be helping people now during COVID? I think any form of entertainment and distraction um, is beneficial for kids. I also think that they should, well, getting creative and thinking outside the box for entertainment is a great idea. So first thing, the weather is definitely improving. Um, it's sunny today. People should be outside walking. Oxygen, sunshine is the best medicine. Exercise is the best medicine. It gets your endorphins up and it's just, you feel amazing. So there's one little, um, I think it was September where I felt, you know, I've been feeling like this up and down, like a roller coaster, like everybody, I think. Um, and I saw this video online and I said, well, that looks like fun. So Reese Witherspoon was um, demonstrating or um, showing her, her famous smoothie that she made every day. And it looked really weird. But I said, you know what? I have to look at what I can control. What can I control? I can control what I eat, my exercise, going outside, being with my family, seeing friends at a distance. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to exercise as much as what I can control. So just for fun, I want to see what would happen if I made this smoothie every day for a week. Now, I actually put it on Instagram for fun. It was an awful smoothie, but I still had it every day for lunch to see what I feel better. I did it, but it was a fun experiment. And I did that fun experiment just because I can do that. It was in my control. So you can do other fun experiments. You could have fun with science. You could read a new book. You can do like pick up a new hobby. There's so many things that are in your control that you should take advantage of. And instead of saying, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. So think outside the box. What can you do? What can you, who can you see? What can you eat? What can you experiment with? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And as um, Karen's interviewed my, um, my mentor and friend with Eager, and she talks about um, the other thing that you can control is what's in your mind. And, you know, I wish kids did a lot more of that instead of all the negative thoughts. And we all, we do it as adults. So it's hard to, you know, get yeah. our kids to do it's it. It's your choice though. If you can, like your, your mind is, it's so manipulative that you can say, well, today I'm going to focus on the positive. Now yeah. you can't always be happy and positive all the time. You can definitely have your, your waves of like, hey, this yeah. sucks. I can't see my friends. I can't go. I have been to a party in two years. Like, this is ridiculous. Or you could choose to look at the positive, what you can control. It's a choice. It's a choice, as Dr. Eager, as her book states every day. She, uh, she actually had taught us goddesses the exercise of looking in the mirror every day, which <clears throat> I told my girls and my son, and say to yourself, there is only one you, you are special. I know it sounds like the Saturday Night Live parody. No, but again, it's so <laughs> true. There's only one you. You are beautiful. You are strong. You can handle today even more than that handle. You can be great and, and go on with your day. And every morning, you know, I have these little sticky pads now on my mirror. I feel like designing a brand new mirror and etch it into the mirror. But I have sticky pads like that saying, you know, about my health and about smiling, just all the little anecdotes from guests that I've learned. So I'm going to add yours on today about using as well. Um, with that being said, I will say um, that I've had moments with my kids where I do feel very hurt for them. And okay, I'll take that step back. But it will actually affect my, me and what I'm thinking in the day. So I've been told the cliche of put your oxygen mask on first, take care of yourself. But I feel like it is so important to let parents know, mothers, that we really need to take care of ourselves first. And like you said, exercise, eat well, sleep well, do all the things that we can do before we can help our teens. Is that right? Can you elaborate 100%. on that? hundred percent. I have a whole list of rituals. That <laughs> Let's I share them with us. For myself. So the first thing I do in the morning is before coffee is I have a, um, a big tall glass of warm water with lemon. It's just so cleansing and just 
hydrates me, gets rid of toxins so I can start my day. And then I'm a little bit of a coffee snob. So I think it was about eight months ago where I said, you know what? I love coffee so much. I'm going to invest in a new coffee maker. My other one actually broke. So I got a beautiful Smeg one, S-M-E-G. I don't know if you've seen that before. Mm -hmm. Love it. It's light blue. I greet it every morning. It's like, hello. I just love my coffee maker. And I get different coffees I try every week. Right now I'm into Mofur Coffee, which is a local company in Toronto. I also love Kicking Horse, Grizzly Claw. And I just love my coffee. I'm also drinking more water. I got this new, um, been drinking from it. It's um, a liter. I refill it twice a day. And it's that little motivation. Remember your goal. Keep checking. Don't give up. Like you need to read this while you're drinking all that water, you know? So I'm taking care of me. And I'm also, you know, my kids are older and they're in university and um, they're busy with their schoolwork. And my husband is a, is a physician. He's really, really busy working very, very hard. And so I have time for myself. So I carve out time, my work time, my me time, my going outside and getting fresh air. I try to see a friend twice a week for a walk outside. So once I take care of those things, I'm good to go. And that's so important to do that for yourself. And then you can help take care of your, your kids. Absolutely. And your home. And it can be a more harmonious environment. Um, I know I've experienced that, that first, firsthand. You too, Michelle? Yeah. And I was wondering, Sharon, what, um, what inspired you to do that? Like to start all those things yeah oh i've always been into self-care and taking putting on the oxygen mask on me first because if i'm not happy no one's happy you know there's a saying called happy wife happy life and it's it's really true like once the wife is happy everybody else is happy or you're only as happy as you're <laughs> Unhappiest, unhappiest child. Kid. That is true too. But I'm really trying to change that to, you know, um, just more of a resilient kind of comment because I, I have to say my, you know, the whole sorority thing here in, in the States is a big, big deal. I have two girls that went through it, two totally different experiences. One picked the one she wanted, got in and loved it for four years. One didn't get the one she wanted. And it was very difficult. It was hard to hear. But what was so amazing, and I don't know, I, I don't want to take credit, but I feel like I helped support this attitude in her. I do feel like it's her positive attitude, just of her genetically, how she is. But she said, Mom, it's fine. I'm going to be sad. Let me be sad for a couple of days. And then I'm going to do something. And I said, what are you going to do? Like part of me was like, just drop out or try again. And I didn't say it. I zipped my mouth. Good but she you. said, she said, I'm going to reach out to people. I know a girl who also feels the same way. I'm going to reach out to her. And she did. And that subsequently, they're now going to be roommates next year in the house. It subsequently helped them to find their bigs, which is like they're the sophomores who are sort of their mentors in the sorority. And she's like, and I'm going to go to the parties with my other friends. And that's it. It's not going to define who I am. I was her. like, are you kidding me? But I do have to say, I feel that COVID and the experience that she had not having a so-called proper American graduation last year, not having prom, you know, all of these experiences being online, even though how difficult it was, in a way, it was a silver lining to helping her be so resilient. Yes, she said to me, how many more things like this is going to happen in my life? But at the same time, she said, I feel really strong. I can, if I can do this, I can do anything. Good for her. She's always been an old soul. She's amazing. But still, that being said, I feel, you know, it's, she told me of, of girls that were hiding in their room and, and thinking going back home because they can't handle the pressure and the stigma or whatever it is of not getting the sorority that they think they wanted. She also told me girls that got the sororities that they wanted and now are regretting it because it's not really the people that they feel that they relate to. So like you said, Sharon, when we make mistakes or things don't go our way as we feel, you know, we have to instill that 
grateful goddess inside of us and bring up those qualities. Absolutely. Well, if our uh, viewers and listeners would like to reach out to you to read your books, um, your upcoming book, when is that going to be released? This summer? The Get Up book is going to be released. We're aiming for August, sometime in August. And it's for adults, for right? And kids? It's, no, it's for, well, it's for adults. Anyone over 11. That's awesome. I think that's safe to say. Anyone over 11. That's great. Mm -hmm. And if they want to reach out to you, how can they best do that? Well, they can go on my website, and that is SharonNeeseArbus.com. And you can contact me through there. There's a um, definitely a reach out, like newsletter, and or just reach out to me or contact me, and I will definitely get an email. And that could be for teens, for anyone, for moms, for educators. Yeah. And my book is uh, Me, My So Called Friends, is available on Amazon. But if you want an autographed uh, copy, I'm happy to send one to you. I'm so happy you got yours early. And I, you know, I got it yesterday. So happy. And I've, I'm already halfway through. <laughs> and then I just kind of skimmed the rest, but I can't wait to go back. And I was like, back to me being that teenage girl in the hallway. You know, a lot of oh moms God. read it said, I, it brings me back. Like, yeah, because actually there's, when I wrote it, it was 2003. And believe it or not, there was no social media back then. Believe it or not. I so when I published it, you know, people said there's no social media. There's no Facebook. There's no Instagram. Like, I'm not going to go back. I, I decided to leave it as it is. I mm -hmm. have to rewrite the entire book. Yeah. But I just decided people still got it. Because social media also has a part in bullying and huge, definitely. And that's, and by the way, if you are listening and you are struggling with being bullied, I want you to know that there is support out there for you to contact and definitely, you know, don't be like me and hide it and stuff it down because it comes out later. Try and tell a friend that you can trust or tell a parent or a teacher and you will hopefully get that support if you don't tell someone else. And there's always, as I tell my kids, you will find your people. You will find your people who may not be the people that you think that you want to be with, but they are. Do you know what I mean? It's not always, you know, that so-called popular girl or that popular boy, because they might be having so many issues themselves and feeling that they need to, you know, bully you. So I, I want people to know out there that there is help. And Thank you so much, Sharon, for teaching us so many incredible lessons that Thank you for having me. Use. And we're so grateful to you for coming on Grateful Goddesses. And we look forward to you and David coming on yes. GGTV, which is the live, interactive Grateful Goddess TV network. You can register at pulver.com where you will hear another interview live with Sharon. And we will get a chance to actually do some actionable steps that she talks about in her new upcoming book. So thank you. thank you again. Thank you. Up next, favorite things, opening up to happiness and joy. Welcome everyone to favorite things with our guest, Sharon Nice Arbus. So I will start with my favorite thing. When I was thinking about today and thinking about me and my so-called friends and the, the, the very embarrassing situation in the hall. One of my favorite, favorite things at that age that really brought me happiness and joy is my roller ball bubble gum lip gloss. And the reason oh. why I still have it today, this is not the original. I ordered it because, oh, it's so luxurious putting it on. It smells good. It tastes a little like bubble gum, but it reminds me of the good times when I was that age. And there were plenty of good times. Don't get me wrong. That episode in the hallway did not define who I was, but um, probably this does because <laughs> this reminds me of having fun and being sparkly and shiny and just really, you know, like chewing a piece of bubble gum, adding some fun and folly to your life. And I still love that today. So it brings me joy. Michelle, how about you? Well, thanks, Karen. I'm wearing my favorite thing. It's a blazer that I got. I love the red against it um, that I had made in Jaipur in India. And um, I was wearing it the other day and I was reminded about how much I love India and just that experience where I picked out the fabric at 8 a.m. and they had it 
um, to me by made um, by 3 p.m. the same day. But um, I love it because I feel like it's it's like a happy jacket, like a, a happy blazer, and it just gives me a lot of joy. And um, it's something I know I'll have forever, and reminds me of the most beautiful place on earth. It's like so. you're wrapping yourself in joy and comfort. Yeah, absolutely. And style. It's very stylish. Well, very important. And Sharon, how about you? What did you bring today? Well, I mentioned before that I have this amazing water bottle that I got from Amazon that it's a leader and has encouragement um, every hour that you need to drink something. So don't give up, keep chugging, well done. I love this. However, right in front of me, I didn't realize this, I have my favorite thing in the world. It's called the Passion Planner. And this is my agenda book. I guess I'm very old school, but it has a week at the glance and it has like my personal to-do list, my work. I have some space where I can doodle and draw and, and just think of things. And even though I have my schedule on my phone, I just love also having it on paper because I get to tick it off. So it just makes me so happy and productive. And I just take it with me everywhere I go. You know, it's so funny because I'm, an old school school girl too. And I have paper calendars everywhere. And I left mine in a store one day. Michelle, I don't know if you remember, I was... I do. And that's why I'm laughing actually, because I know you so well. <laughs> I left it in a store. I bought a belt and then I left. I came home and where was my planner? And I'm like, I called the store and I said, please, please look for it. It's my life. It has everything in it. They, they said, it's not here. And I ran back to the store and it was sitting right there on the counter. I'm like, this is gold. That's the only problem with paper is that, you know, if you lose it, it's gone. It's but, gone. Um, but it's so, if it's so nice to like write with the paper and pen and also what you mentioned earlier about writing stories, about writing them down with paper yeah. and can be so cathartic as well. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your stories and your lessons. And I know this will help a tremendous amount of people listening out there. And we can't wait to work with you again on GGTV and learn some more actionable steps to bring your tap into your inner goddess of resiliency and um, enjoy your day. Thank you so thank much. Thank you guys too. Thanks, Sharon. Thank Thanks, you. Sharon. Unleashed your inner goddess yet? Thanks for joining us today on Grateful Goddesses. We invite you to visit our website, www.gratefulgoddesses.com to access today's show notes as well as other helpful resources. Don't forget to leave a review. Until next time, stay strong and empowered to be a grateful goddess.